Well, here we are. Um, here we are again uh, today to talk about uh, the Ronald Reagan period uh, in the history of globalization. Um, I don't think we can say that Reagan invented globalization, but he has uh, put some of the finishing touches on it in its final, in its final form, you might say. Uh, that is say in its in its financialized form. Uh, that uh, that is a contribution that uh, Reagan makes in the nineteen in the 1980s. We'll talk about Reagan today. We'll talk about the changes to the world system. We might start to call it a new world order uh, at this uh, at this point. And um, next time we'll talk about the fall of the Soviet Union. And um, I will be uh, general, genuine, generally arguing that um, um, that um, Reagan's uh, Reagan's foreign policy and and some much of Reagan's economic policy might not have panned out as uh, as well as it did for him had it not been for the fall of the Soviet Union. So I'll try to um, try to give an indication of the relation between those two big events and uh, how they uh, kind of in a certain sense crucially depend upon each other. I take the view generally that uh, Reagan's reputation in U.S. history. Uh, um, generally has to do with the uh, person who was on the watch when um, the Soviet Union fell and who therefore is in a position to take credit uh, for it. Um, so it's a kind of an important uh, juxtaposition of two uh, enormous events that are not always uh, properly uh, connected by historical narratives, but we want to try to want to try to eventually uh, develop a, um, a series of ideas about that. Um, I want to warn you that um, we're getting ready uh, to um, do our book reviews, not warn you, but remind you that uh, we're um, getting ready to hand in our book reviews. And so be thinking about the topics that you uh, that you might want to look further into. For example, on this question of Reagan today, you, um, and the, the Reagan reputation, Reagan's contribution to globalism, you could write a paper on that, um, you know, find a, a decent scholarly article on that or decent uh, book on that and uh, and uh, do a review and give an indication how it contributes to our discussion of the matter uh, take into consideration the context that is provided by this course when you write these uh, book reviews uh, the context uh, that is say what we're arguing in class or what we're you know what we're thinking what questions we're asking and how your book review you know helps helps us understand that uh, uh, that uh, question. Okay, so that will be coming up on um, um, the 20th of uh, April, and I'll talk to you some more about it as we, uh, as we, uh, as we go forward. Today, let's talk about Reagan then. As I uh, just said, it puts the finishing touches on the new world order, on the order of globalization. Uh, you might say the Europeans, in, a, in effect, uh, uh, began to do this when they challenged the Bretton Woods system under General de Gaulle, and they started asking for gold put pressure on the dollar, uh, you might say that that's really the beginning of the contribution. So I, and, and when you say the Europeans, you're pretty much saying the French. So you might make the argument that I would certainly make this argument. Not all of you would have to, but I would certainly make this argument that the French uh, played a big role in creating this globalized system by making this enormous challenge to the Bretton Woods system. And I don't know, as long as we're on that, uh, on that, uh, scheme of, uh, of, uh, of response there. Um, maybe we could even say maybe losing the war in Vietnam or the, uh, put it another way, you know, the, uh, the uh, opponents of uh, U.S. forces in Vietnam made a contribution to the New World Order by uh, providing their challenge to the Bretton Woods system. So there are lots of ways to argue this as, uh, as historians, and um, we should get to talking more about it. But the, the main point we're trying to get to is the financialization of the system. The system is dominated by finance and how that is made possible by oil. So it is a, uh, it is, it is a system that is run pretty much by finance and uh, that financial hold over the whole world economic system is, is made possible by oil. And then the question you have to ask is, how was the control of oil determined during this period? And uh, what impact of states on the situation in oil uh, created our globalization? So those are a cluster of questions we're asking about this, uh, about this topic. So um, I've been referring to uh, Reagan's uh, 
um, political constituency in the Republican Party as being more or less the Southern constituency. Some might say the cowboy constituency in the um, Republican Party represents the Southern Rim, represents Southern California. Southern California is still able to carry California at this time. Orange County, very powerful Republican strongholds. It's capable of carrying, carrying California. That won't be the case. Um, another 10 years, it'll start to change dramatically. Uh, and as you know, today, California is a blue state. So uh, um, that all has uh, been reversed in a very dramatic, uh, dramatic way. But in those days, California might be considered part of the Southern Rim and uh, part of this uh, kind of conception the Russian, the uh, Russians, the Republicans are starting to um, uh, cook up this idea that uh, they, they're basically a Southern party, that they uh, represent um, the old Bourbon, Bourbon South that used to be solidly democratic, but no longer is so because of the civil rights movement, because of the new uh, voting rights legislation passed by the Johnson administration. So, um, okay, they represent this special uh, branch of, uh, of um, American republicanism, and uh, there's a certain antagonism, you might say, at least in the political realm, certain antagonism um, between this um, um, right wing of the Republican Party, the cowboy wing, the southern wing, uh, we might say, um, and the other wing of the Republican Party, uh, represented in the north, uh, associated generally with the name of Rockefeller, trilateral commission, things of that sort. Um, Reagan represents something a little different from their perspectives. And um, of course, in the political realm, even if they may not represent completely different things, uh, dramatically different things, uh, they're still a very much, very uh, sharply uh, antagonistic in the political realm because, you know, there has to be a fight for power to get control of the party if you're going to be able to rule the country. So at any rate, that's what he represents, a cowboy, kind of a cowboy uh, um, capitalism, I, I suppose, cowboy wing of the Republican Party. It's a little more sternly right wing, a little more radical, uh, certainly on foreign policy, much more hostile to the Soviet Union. Um, you know, much more stern about every question really uh, represents what Barry Goldwater um, uh, once represented, but uh, maybe to a much greater ex extent. So um, at any rate, this, this is the wing that gets control of the party and uh, uh, generally, generally uh, uh, considered today as a, a kind of a an enormous step forward for the country and all the rest. You know, there's a, there's a lionization of, uh, of Ronald Reagan. As you know, uh, there are many, many monuments, you know, freeways, airports, things like that. In fact, there was a commission um, that was um, designed in order to figure out ways to name things after Ronald Reagan. There's a, definitely a certain feeling, and even in the Democratic Party and the Obama administration, uh, what a fabulous figure. Uh, Reagan was a great, great man. He is in uh, in American history, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you know, people on the other side of it uh, took a little, di little different view of the matter. They um, thought he was a little bit of a fake. Um, they referred to him as a second-rate um, um, uh, B, B B movie actor. This is not true and not fair uh, to to Ronald Reagan. He was not a B. He was not in B movies generally. Uh, he was in movies that I don't know what to say about them. Bedtime for Bonzo, some of these movies, you know, not whatever you might say about the quality of them. They were not B movies. They were um, they were A movies. He was an A movie actor and uh, never a really great, powerful male lead, uh, but a very good actor. And what he did uh, was quite good. And some of his films, King's Row, um, he always referred to as a a real a real how to put it, an excellent performance, certainly justifiable. Anyhow, here's what the, uh, the, um, the uh, liberal uh, uh, cartoonist, uh, Herblock, uh, writing for the Washington Post at this time, uh, that's what he thought of Reagan, sort of a cardboard figure, and, and Reagan himself trying to create this kind of cardboard, uh, uh, cardboard image, and uh, quite fake, and all the rest of it, and uh, not a not a really very real cat. And then there's the other uh, perception about Ronald Reagan, the other in, uh, negative perception about Ronald Reagan that uh, his regime was of, by, and for um, uh, the richest people in the United States. Uh, you know, hard to argue against that um, if you look at the numbers. But uh, uh, at any rate, this is a, 
a viewpoint that has been suggested about um, about Ronald Reagan. Also, he is the overseer of a, a great transformation that goes on in uh, American American economy that has to do with uh, the financialization of the American economy and um, uh, hostile takeovers. Um, uh, where the uh, workings of people like T. Boone Pickens and um, uh, the other people who invented uh, junk bonds in order to uh, leverage the buyouts of various firms um, uh, so that they all get taken over. And um, and some of these um, um, takeovers, you know, uh, are quite piratical. And uh, it's kind of a new thing in American capitalism, you know, for a firm to which is making money, doing per pretty well reasonably um, uh, to have its stock bought bought up pretty much against its will against the, the uh, existing leadership's will and suddenly to find out that um, they've been bought out against their will and um, there's entirely new management new management comes in and carry out carries out tremendous layoffs maybe sells off a lot of the equipment <laughs> um, um, leverages it uh, takes advantage of, of its ability to acquire debt and does all kinds of financial and um, um, management shenanigans and sometimes even ruins completely ruins a firm um, and uh, walks away with a tremendous profit from the from the exercise so the leveraged buyout the uh, pillage in effect of a lot of big um, sturdy old family industrial businesses is a notion that is associated very much with this period comes forward in the 80s with uh, Reagan and made possible uh, by a rather considerable wave of deregulation um, it isn't always um, um, recognized that uh, all these hostile takeovers, mergers, leveraged buyouts, stock buyouts, um, and all the rest of that stuff, that uh, all this was underpinned um, by the deregulation of oil. So that oil plays a big, big role in this. Now, let me talk more about that in just a second. Um, uh, but before I do, uh, let me also talk about the uh, development of the uh, um, the uh, um, executive compens um, uh, um, executive compensation explosion uh, during this period uh, they get a tremendous some firms now are paying executives a tremendous amount of mon amounts of money a, a much greater differential between them and the uh, lower management or the workers uh, than ever existed um, uh, and um, they they are really uh, doing splendid. And this also attributes, or this also connects to the idea of the uh, um, the uh, um, uh, financial uh, takeover of the of the uh, of the economy. Um, now, once again, I suggest that, that this has for some time now, since the Kissinger time, uh, this uh, rearrangement of all of the world money flows and all the rest of that is dependent on uh, dependent on oil. So, so oil is at the center of world politics. It's difficult to imagine difficult to imagine how all these big changes in finance uh, could have been done um, if there wasn't this factor of oil, um, if, if there was not any need, if, uh, basically all the societies in the world are some variation on an automobile society. Um, if this uh, hadn't been the case, it's difficult to imagine the financialization of the world. So we really, we have to connect it with oil. We'll talk more about it as we as we go on, but we uh, we absolutely have to. Now, you know, the general shape of it has to do with what uh, Frieden calls a strange triangle. And what here is actually a rectangle, but it has to do with, you know, raising the oil price through the oil shocks, large um, um, oil bills now being paid by the countries without oil, uh, but, uh, but um, uh, paid by everybody, paid by the United States, of course. Um, uh, uh, enormous payments uh, for for um, uh, for oil going to the oil exporting countries, um, and then all that money has to go somewhere, and it goes into the New York banks. Now, there's a certain literature that makes the argument that all this was set up ahead of time and and constitutes a kind of a plot. I don't know whether to dismiss this or not. I just rep, I just um, suggest it now. I just uh, reference it now. Um, so that you uh, will be aware of this, uh, this literature and this, uh, this uh, perspective um, is certainly arguable, uh, but, uh, you know, then one can discuss the evidence and all the rest of that, but um, uh, that has been an argument that has been, that has been made. There's a sort of innocent way of, um, of describing it that uh, has been made by two editors of the Financial Times, Karen Cross and McRae, 
and a book called The Second Great Crash, which discusses this in very quite lucid terms. And, and it says that, uh, um, well, OPEC came into all this money as a result of, uh, of uh, these two oil shocks um, and uh, didn't know what to do with it. And uh, it's in the position of a person who's won the Irish sweepstakes. So um, the money has come in, you've got all this money, and then you not exactly sure what your next step is going to be with this huge hoard uh, that you've suddenly acquired. Um, the phone is ringing off the hook. People are uh, coming to you with all sorts of projects, um, some of them friends of yours, some of them not. Uh, but everybody's got a way for you to spend your money, and uh, you're not sure, you know, which way to go, who to trust, what to do, blah, blah, blah. Um, and in the end, you say to yourself, well, at least for the time being, I think I'll just put it in a bank. And so Karen Cross and McRae say, that's essentially what the oil exporting countries did. They just decided to put it in the New York banks. <laughs> so that is a fairly innocent and straightforward and uh, kind of, uh, in many ways, uh, um, unintuitive, uh, or I should say intuitive uh, way of, uh, uh, way of uh, thinking of the matter. But one way or another, it does end up in uh, New York banks, and then they don't know what to do with it. You know, it's, uh, it's on your hands. It's, uh, you've got to make it, uh, put it to work and um, uh, they reach out for sovereign loans. And so uh, they start to send these sovereign loans out uh, and they were in the confidence that generally states don't go broke, uh, that they can uh, figure out a way, it's up to them, uh, figure out a way to pay their bills and eventually they will be a, a decent investment. And um, that this sets up a kind of a system where these uh, banks having lent all this money to these NOPEC borrowers um, can sit back and uh, watch the borrowers um, um, try to figure out what to do what to do next money goes back to the ex oil exporting uh, countries for oil the circle circuit starts again um, and at a certain point, maybe they go broke, uh, these, uh, these NOPECs, they go broke and they start borrowing money and, well, we can lend them, uh, we can lend them money. Um, and so that is the circle, or you might say the spiral uh, that is set up. That is the basis of the New World Order. Uh, that is the basic mechanism. Well, the uh, strange triangle is the way it is described by Jeffrey Frieden, and it's been described in various other ways, but that really is the central motif, the central idea, the rearrangement of all of these money flows uh, throughout the world um, during uh, the period we're, uh, we're discussing. All right, so where were these things when Reagan uh, came to office? Uh, you know, I think the, uh, you could say that the, uh, the Europeans were defending, or I should say the uh, Europeans were threatening the dollar. Uh, you know, you could describe the destruct destruction of Bretton Woods in terms of the um, uh, the European efforts. You know, it's a balance of payments crisis. It's mainly uh, um, uh, caused, um, well, I don't say that, what it's caused, but that the main effect of the thing um, um, is that um, uh, major holders of, of currencies uh, are turning in these Euro dollars and they want they want gold for it, so there's pressure on the gold supply. It meets pressure on the dollar. The United States eventually closes off the, the dollar spigot, closes the gold window in uh, August 15th, on August 15th, 19, 1971. Um, you could say maybe it's the Europeans that did this. Uh, did they stop threatening the dollar after this? You know, their euro dollars are turning into petrodollars. Um, um, in the period of the oil shocks, um, maybe you could make the argument that uh, they are continuing to try to fight back France at their center. Now, France is important in our discussion where it is practically not mentioned in most of the literature on globalization. I don't know why this is, but uh, we apparently seem to be alone and um, seeing the French as a factor in all of this. I mean, I'm not saying it's the greatest factor, but it's a factor in the same way that it was in the 20s uh, with the uh, scramble for gold that went on then. Um, it, it's similar now, and um, even though everybody is now off the gold standard, the, the Bretton Woods gold exchange standard, that is, gold still sells on the open market. We don't know why, 
No one know, no one knows why. Uh, but there is one suggestion that is always lurking in the background when you consider the rise of the price of gold. That is to say, the decline of the dollar in gold. And that is the idea that there might someday be a new currency. I mean, this idea is with us today and very, very much thought about by everyone who, who's serious about these things. Um, that some new currency might come forward and uh, maybe it might be based on gold. So that is an idea for the proponents of the dollar, those who favor the dollar, those who consider their interests tied to the dollar, as something for them to worry about. Um, so um, European continu Europe continues to threaten the dollar. The French, you could say, continue to threaten the dollar throughout the period Reagan is in power. And they will be doing so um, uh, doing so for quite a while. And you might even say that uh, the French are still restive uh, in the world economic and political order and military order as well. I mean, uh, you know, the greatest critic of NATO nowadays is the French president, Macron, who says that uh, NATO is brain dead. <laughs> wow, that's strongly put. Uh, General de Gaulle couldn't have put that more sharply. Um, NATO is brain dead. What's the point? Uh, NATO only made sense as long as the Soviet Union was threatening or perceived to be threatening Europe. Um, and uh, there's no Soviet Union anymore and the Russians don't threaten anybody. And um, what's the point of NATO, Macron asks. Uh, you know, very sharp question for which there is uh, not an easy answer. Or at any rate, not as easy an answer as some uh, seem, to, seem to think. All right, so the Europeans then threatening the dollar. And how can you say this? Well, it, it, all you have to do is look at the gold price. And uh, there you can see it. But all of that is hinging on, on oil. I mean, the, and the gold price is going up and the gold price is tracking the oil graph. So here's a, an oil graph. It's not, a, uh, it's not a gold graph. I could have done that, but uh, we happen not to have it here. So um, here it is. And you should become very familiar with it. I have shown you this basic graph a number of times now, and you should become very familiar with this. This is essentially the terrain over which um, the globalization around oil uh, um, uh, travels. And so you see the oil shock, first oil shock, 73, and, and then uh, the period after that, uh, kind of a tapering off, the second oil shock with the... Uh, the fall of the Shah of Iran, and then you see a peak in the thing. So where is the peak? It's right up at the top here, and this is just as Ronald Reagan comes into office. Well, really, it's in the fading days of the Carter administration, just in the transition from Carter to Reagan. That is the absolute peak in the oil price. And then look what we have to explain as historians, this absolutely dramatic decline down into 1985. So that is the Reagan administration. Reagan can point to this chart with great pride, his shadow, that is, could point to this chart with great pride, say, look at our achievement here. Look what was happening with oil. Look what, what oil was doing to the world. And we brought it under control. We brought it under control. Well, a um, number of things brought it under control. Uh, during this period right here, we have the establishment of a uh, of a commodities exchange. We have the oil price determination slipping out of the hands of the NATO uh, notables, the NATO bigwigs, and into the hands of the uh, energy brokers who, and the futures market, uh, because uh, oil is sold generally through futures contracts uh, during, this, during this period. And so that's a big factor. The OPEC is losing control of the oil price determination. The Saudis are working against it. They are uh, in league with the United States, or at any rate, sympathetic toward the pressure uh, that this oil price rise puts on the United States, and especially puts on its um, its dollar uh, because of the, what it, uh, the, the effect it seems to have on gold. Um, and so they are uh, acting as a swing producer. That's a phrase that you run across in the literature all the time, swing producer, just meaning the Saudis are producing in such a way as to lower the price. That is to say they're producing a lot in order to try to uh, lower the price. So they're acting against the interests of OPEC. They're in, in with the United States and uh, acting against OPEC. Now, uh, why is that? Why is that, we asked before? 
I believe the answer we gave was that, well, they have to be afraid of the United States. Uh, they're in league with the United States, can't live without the United States, strictly speaking, but uh, at the same time, they also have to be afraid because on a number of occasions, uh, it, the American administration discussed invading Saudi, Saudi Arabia, and it could easily do that, at least if it were only a military question, it could uh, carry that off. So um, it's, a, it's a genuine, it's a genuine, how to put it, it's a genuine threat that uh, um, helps us explain why the Saudis are so much in the pocket of the United States in playing the swing role. But, you know, it's not complete even there. Uh, in return for that, Saudis are going to nationalize um, um, Aramco, the biggest, biggest Saudi oil company, going to nationalize it. Well, that, you can't say that they didn't gain anything from this, um, this position as a swing swing producer. And then while we've talked about the nationalizations, we have to take up the whole question of nationalization, how what a big role it plays now in the oil industry generally. We've got a whole raft of nationalizations. I can hardly name them all. There's a whole swing of them. Libya, when Gaddafi took power in 1970, nationalized oil. Um, uh, Iran nationalized oil. Um, uh, um, Saudi Arabia now with Aramco nationalizes oil. We have Iraq has nationalized oil. Venezuela, Kuwait, so that has a big impact on Gulf oil, uh, losing its reserves in Kuwait. Um, Algeria, Qatar, um, and the Emirates. Uh, so this is a raft. I haven't, I haven't really even um, touched on all of it. And um, Frieden gives us a little better description of it, although it's pretty vast. The number of uh, nationalizations generalizing, you could probably say two thirds to three quarters of the oil reserves of uh, the United States, or excuse me, the oil reserves of the, uh, the big oil companies, big oil, uh, the seven sisters there, uh, usually called, uh, pass out of their hands and into the hands of national oil companies. So the seven sisters phrase comes from a book by Anthony Sampson, and, um, and it's a, a, a very good book, but quite out of date now, but um, a very good, um, very good description of the history of the major oil companies. And these are mainly British and American oil. They're Western oil companies, British and American oil companies for the most part. So these are the sisters themselves. You have um, the descendants of um, uh, Standard Oil broken up um, in the beginning of the, or at the end of the 19th century through the uh, Antitrust, um, antitrust legislation. So, Esso, former Standard Oil of New Jersey, um, Mobil, uh, former uh, um, uh, <clears throat> Standard Oil of New York, Soconi used to be called uh, Standard Oil of New York, uh, Chevron, uh, SoCal, um, Standard Oil of California. So, uh, British Petroleum in here, formerly the um, Anglo-Iranian. Uh, uh, oil company um, uh, transformed into British British Petroleum, and uh, you see BP gas stations all over the place uh, now uh, nowadays. Uh, Royal Dutch Royal Dutch Shell has a kind of a Dutch, but also partially British ownership. It's a little murky, um, uh, but a very old oil company. Um, Gulf in the United States, property of the Mellon family in Pittsburgh. Um, um, and that will that will be transferred during this period, and then uh, um, uh, Texas company uh, uh, Texaco. Uh, so these are the uh, these are the seven the seven sisters as uh, as they were uh, known up to this period, and um, they lose pretty much all their reserves. Well, lion's share of their reserves uh, in these nationalizations. It's a blow against big oil. Now, those of us who think in terms of big powers hanging on to their resources and their states generally uh, trying to act in um, in a way that's defensive of uh, the interests of uh, their biggest um, economic uh, economic forces uh, might wonder uh, if the United States is the most powerful country in the world, certainly some person from Mars um, observing this might ask the question, if the United States is the most powerful country in the world, how can the United States permit, um, or the West in general, permit um, all this oil to be nationalized um, 
why didn't it do something about it? There's not an easy answer to that question, but it's a great question. Why didn't the United States or whatever power there was in the world prevent uh, various countries? And some of them are not huge countries. They're not great powers by any means. Libya and Algeria are not great powers. Why would the United States permit this to happen? If you take the view, for example, that the United States is a tremendous imperialist power. Some people make this argument, U.S. imperialism, etc., etc. And when they say U.S. imperialism, they're talking about the 19th century. So imagine this in the 19th century, a series of resource nationalizations. Uh, and this term now comes up, uh, resource nationalism uh, in the 1980s. Um, how would it be possible for them to carry out all these nationalizations and uh, not have the gunboats in the harbor? I mean, um, over credit questions, gunboats were in the harbor in um, Mexico, 1860, in Tunis, 1881, Egypt, 1882. It's not something we haven't seen. Um, why weren't the uh, gunboats in the harbor? Why weren't the, why didn't the biggest powers uh, object to this and use force uh, against this? I guess you, when you give an answer, and I don't want to give a very polished answer right now, but if you, um, if you do start to answer this question, I guess you have to ask whether the United States is the main power involved here, uh, has had a very good experience with its interventions and what it's going through now uh, with its public and its Congress uh, about the whole question of interventionism. Kind of a funny phrase, internet interventionism, but you hear it um, used uh, with a lot of people these days. It's popular very much in the discourse. Um, interventionism meaning um, there's a kind of a choice whether to intervene or not in um, some, some big thing that involves a big country's interest. Um, why wasn't the United States more interventionist? What was it that kept it? It was losing in Vietnam. It had sent 600,000 troops to Vietnam. 60,000 of them or so not coming back. American public very unhappy, practically in arms, burning up the cities and all the rest that we've been describing. Uh, quite a huge tumult over this question of intervening, intervening abroad, quite a mood in Congress, the Tunney Amendment over Angola, the Boland Amendment over Central America, uh, quite a mood in Congress that we don't want any more interventions, at least for the moment, or let's slow it down. This attitude of solvency we're talking about and many of the perspectives that go into the ideas of detente, not necessarily Henry Kissinger's ideas, but uh, a lot of uh, ideas of supporters of Henry Kissinger's detente, uh, the solvents, certainly the solvency school, um, it's against this. So it isn't quite right. Well, we've had other, other periods when we see that the third world gets highly rested when the weakness of the um, European powers is evident. I mean, we said that about Suez in 1956, that immediately after the British and French defeat in Suez and the emergence of Nasser as the more or less victim or, or victor, um, uh, or perhaps just survivor of the Suez affair, uh, that there's a virtual jailbreak of all of the British and French colonies. Uh, and um, that's the moment when their colonialism uh, goes into a much different phase, uh, to put it mildly. And I'd say that it has to deal with national independence, has to figure out a new way um, to um, satisfy itself vis-a-vis -vis its former, former colonies. Um, okay, so there's a general weakness or some kind of other kind of description has to help us uh, to understand why the nationalizations were permitted. And we're in the wake of the Vietnam experience. And so maybe our explanation would have to start by citing some of these, some of these factors. At any rate, the, um, the Seven Sisters turned into a new grouping. And if we were to talk about the Seven Sisters today, we'd have an entirely different, uh, different party. Um, I mean, we'd have Saudi Arabia, Iran, Venezuela, um, Gazprom, Russia, there are, other, there are other big Russian oil companies too, Petrobras, um, um, for Brazil, Petronas, for uh, 
Malaysia. These would be the new uh, seven sisters. And they've got, you know, somewhere around 80% or so of the uh, reserves uh, uh, in, that are known in the world. And so you can imagine the mood among the old seven sisters um, um, uh, that, first of all, they've got to figure out ways to find new oil. I mean, um, we said Prudhoe Bay, we said the North Sea, um, and they, well, we said um, offshore drilling, uh, new, riskier, um, uh, wilder schemes in order to try to extract oil in new ways. What has uh, sometimes been put under the heading of extreme oil, that's one response to this thing. The rest of it is maybe they have to go into a whole series of mergers. And um, really, that was what happened in the 1980s. So these mergers w wouldn't be cricket under old notions of um, antitrust. So the Reagan administration was had to be on board with these things and its mood of deregulation was such as to, in effect, nullify, uh, virtually nullify the antitrust tradition uh, in the United States. And so giant mergers go on and then we're going to get even more of them. In the 90s, we'll have to start talking about even bigger mergers, mega mergers um, going on until uh, even in banking, uh, the two giants of US banking history, the Rockefellers and the Morgans, um, end up merging by the year 2000. So this enormous, what you might call merger mania, um, and they are buying each other up. They're buying um, small oil companies, large oil companies. Chevron bought Gulf, Texaco bought Getty Oil, um, Mobile brought, uh, bought Superior, Occidental bought City Service, um, British, British Petroleum bought uh, Standard Oil of Ohio, um, um, Amoco uh, bought uh, Dome uh, Oil of uh, Canada, um, and we could go on. And there's a great deal of this uh, information in Frieden. Uh, um, and it did, uh, more or less gives, gives the picture of a huge reconsolidation. A lot of this has to be done with the help of finance. And, and so this is part of the process, I think, of uh, financializing. And, and let's step back as historians, though, and make some observations about it. Um, the merger mania, it has to be regarded as a kind of a process of um, defeat and transition that's going on in the oil industry among uh, the uh, among the uh, leaders of big big oil so in a way uh, oil does not call its shots independent of finance if it ever did um, uh, at any rate to as great a degree as it did as it did before and uh, our period deals with the particular phenomenon uh, without which I guess the Reagan administration can't properly be assessed. And that is what is usually called in the historian's uh, accounts, uh, the Volcker shock, so-called for the Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker. So he's an appointee of Jimmy Carter and uh, brought into power at the very end of the Carter administration, 1979. Carter administration's uh, suffering a terrible inflation. There's a pretty much pretty big rise in interest rates, big rise in interest rates in England as well. Uh, and um, Margaret Thatcher came into power in uh, 1979 and started to act against it. And in fact, they had a kind of a doctrine. Um, uh, her uh, favorite economist, Keith Joseph, made this argument that there had to be a, a big um, deflation. Uh, that's a big uh, increases in interest rates. And um, Paul Volcker pretty much pursues that line. Of course, nobody has ever pursued it uh, to the degree that, that Volcker did it. Uh, once he came into power, he started raising interest rates and um, together with Reagan, Reagan, of course, giving his blessing. Remember, he's a Carter appointee as Volcker, uh, worked for the Rockefellers. And uh, you could say that Reagan has been a critic of the Rockefellers up at the time. But he's not so critical as to criticize uh, Volcker on this stuff. So um, uh, Volcker then starts to raise the interest rates. And there we are. Look at the peak. That's 1981 or so. Uh, and there is the there is the history of inter rate, uh, interest rates from 1930. <laughs> so so this is a uh, 
this is a quite a unique event. And um, if we want to understand the Reagan rearrangement of all of the economic affairs in the world, you, you cannot do it without the uh, consideration of the Volcker shock. So uh, raising interest rates up to around 20%. Wow, 20%, 20%, uh, hard to imagine how any business uh, can go on at 20% interest rates. But of course, luring hot money, you can't beat it for that. I mean, if there's money that's looking for the highest interest rates, 20% is gonna pull it in. Uh, in, the, uh, in the 1920s, just prior to the Great Depression, um, the bankers said that 10% uh, interest rates would pull money out of the moon. So you can imagine what 20% interest rates uh, would mean in 1980. And uh, consider somebody who's speculating in gold, watching a huge increase in gold price. He thinks he's going to make a killing there. Suddenly he says, uh, gee, uh, this gold thing is speculative, but the, uh, the money I can get for uh, depositing my money, the interest rate I can get uh, from a, uh, an American bank, uh, that's all guaranteed. That is not a, uh, that is not a risk. Gold you're not sure of. This year, this is a given. So you can see how money comes out of the gold market and goes into interest rates. But you also see why business sags everywhere um, because uh, when interest rates go up and everybody is putting their money away in this sense, it's practically like getting out of economic activity altogether. So um, an enormous depression uh, would have to be assumed to result. Now, uh, Frieden explains to us the basic banking theory uh, in the 19th century that is associated with the English gold standard and the pound and all that. And um, he lays it down that uh, this, uh, this raise in interest rates is a standard reflex, a standard um, um, tool of the, uh, of, the, of the big banks. And uh, when they face a deficit in the balance of payments and a gold outflow, and they want to protect this gold and get gold back, uh, they raise the interest rates. But one of the concomitants of that is that it's bad for business and introduces depression at home. Uh, and what's the, what's the expected mechanism of the thing? Um, and business is bad. There are bankruptcies. Firms go out of business. Um, um, workers start to get very, very fearful. Um, uh, and uh, they, they're not so bold about wage increases. As a matter of fact, they're willing to take wage cuts. Yeah, wages are driven down. And of course, they're saying, and really, uh, Frieden stresses that this is the idea of it. Wa wages are, sp are driven down in the, pro and the and in the process, as wages come down, confidence starts to return. Um, it looks as if uh, there's going to be more uh, um, business opportunity uh, because uh, the, the costs the costs are less and uh, it's easier to guarantee a profit. And uh, confidence gradually returns and we get a recovery. And that's the cycle. Um, as is described um, by Frieden for the 19th century. And that still more or less obtains. I think that model, that idea more or less obtains throughout this period. And you can even say it's not dead today. Uh, that sort of a model. I mean, I'm not saying the banks always behave in a deflationary way, but when they're thinking in terms of deflation, this is what they're thinking about. And uh, this big deflation that... Uh, um, that Volcker is introducing with these 20% interest rates, um, that affects the people who have to borrow money to buy, to buy oil. So they are definitely under the, under the gun. And if they have borrowed money at a certain point and uh, reach a point where they can't make their payments, have to go borrowing money, then they're really at the mercy of the monetary authority. So here we're thinking about the International Monetary Fund and um, this cartoon. Uh, gives gives the conception that uh, there's money being offered um, to somebody who's having difficulties, uh, such, for example, as the Mexicans had in 1982, uh, when they couldn't make their couldn't make their loan payments. They had borrowed money um, initially, and uh, and uh, they couldn't make their payments, and they had to borrow some more money, and so eventually that that money is given them. But when it's given to them, it's given to them with conditionality. There are conditions associated 
uh, with it. And uh, the conditions, in effect, uh, make them rearrange their economic policy at home. They gotta have a balanced budget, gotta lay off public employees, um, <clears throat> got to uh, open things up for um, foreign investment, um, um, got to privatize if possible, deregulate, um, and all the rest of that. So um, this cartoon tells us, shows us how a, a Mexican uh, a Mexican journalist might look at um, the, the handouts that came from the International Monetary Fund as a result of the crisis of 1982. So it, it uh, starts in Mexico. They usually call it the Mexican debt crisis of 1982, but sometimes it's called the world debt crisis because Mexico is not the only one in this condition. And generally going through this same series of uh, responses. Um, so um, so that um, that is the model, more or less. That is the idea that uh, that we can see. There's a certain conditionality. Now, um, what happens uh, in the third world countries who we were talking about maybe a few weeks ago, as um, nationalists and as uh, opponents of the European imperialism and, um, you know, desirous of their own independent, newly independent countries, perhaps, and that sort of thing, uh, who might be thought of as kind of revolutionary nationalists. What happens to them? That perspective really falls by the wayside in the course of this um, series, of, series of events. And... Uh, and what we get is a different kind of perspective among the elites. Now, there's always, and it always existed, but this perspective comes to the fore uh, rather more stridently. And really, it's the survivor perspective, which is um, playing ball, playing ball uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the International Monetary Fund, playing ball with the New World Order, playing ball with the financial authorities who pretty much have all the cards to play. In, and you can still play in the game, but you've got to play their game. Um, and in terms of um, the notion of imperialism, the ideology, I guess you would have to say, of imperialism in the third world among many third world intellectuals like to see uh, their countries, their national bourgeoisies, you know, rising up against the Western imperialists. This is the reverse of what they want. And it's, uh, to put it in the language of imperialism and anti-imperialism, this is a comprador perspective. Comprador meaning um, uh, someone who plays ball with the outside powers. Um, and who is not a nationalist, who rejects nationalism and opposes the nationalists, and who instead um, um, argues for positivism vis-a-vis uh, vis-a-vis um, vis the more powerful imperial country. That's the model. Um, and what can we say then? That in the third world we can generalize and say that the the neoliberal compradors have come to the fore and they have superseded the nationalists as a result of um, these loans given with their neoliberal um, conditionality. Um, and as a result of it, generalizing about the whole world order now, as we're trying to do, um, we have to say that the uh, mass of debt now starts to pile up in a dramatic way. So here's a graph that shows the mass of, of the external debt of third world countries. Um, <clears throat> and it shows it, um, well, it's, it's prominent all along. It shows it beginning to take off with the first oil shock. And uh, then it takes off with the second oil shock, Volcker shock um, credit crisis, Mexican and other credit crisis. Uh, you see it starting to really take off. And then uh, through this period, it's going to take off all the more and uh, will eventually reach enormous heights. So you, you watch the graph and there's the argument. Um, what happens to third world debt? So third world debt becomes, at least in the perspectives of our cartoonists, uh, becomes a way of, of, of um, yoking the developing nations, the poor nations of the world, uh, yoking them um, uh, more firmly. Um, uh, to, uh, to the financial authorities at the center of the New World Order, and especially to the International Monetary Fund. Um, and the, here's a description of conditionality. The International Monetary Fund Coast Guard is talking to the developing nation and telling them, throw your baggage overboard. 
uh, it's like in the treasure of Sierra Madre when the bandits uh, say to the miners, uh, uh, give us your guns and we'll be on our way. <laughs> so that, that, is the, that is the point. And there's another way of, uh, of describing it, another cartoon on it, you know, that uh, it's a fire and uh, what's needed is to put the fire out and people are using gasoline in order to, <laughs> and, the, um, and the Last Supper. <laughs> The Last Supper, the IMF holding the Last Supper and the Third World Nations all at the uh, table. And these gentlemen will be having bread and water. <laughs> there is the, uh, the, the mood, and one could say, you know, that maybe in the old days, imperialism held the, uh, held the Third World uh, in, its, in its grip. Um, and maybe it doesn't hold it in its grip in quite the same way now, but nevertheless, there's a certain con continuity. Um, all right, all right. So that's the impact it had on the whole world. It's reshaping the whole world and um, really, how to put it, you might even think of this as a kind of a death blow to the uh, third world nationalism of the Cold War period. Um, the question has been asked, and some have made the case in, in this way. Um, some people still see them making a squawk about the whole thing, um, still trying to resist, uh, still making arguments in the United Nations, still defending some of these older orders of a new economic um, uh, order that favors the third world, such as suggested by Algeria and Libya, people like Nia Rere and, um, and others. Um, but it's not very strong anymore and, and increasingly overwhelmed by the economic conditions. All right, so that's a major change we have to note. We have to put it in the early 80s because it really sets in there in the sharpest possible way. Uh, Ronald Reagan didn't invent this or anything. He's just overseeing it, but there it is. That's a uh, finishing touches, you could say, on the, uh, the international, the new international world order uh, of money. But the Volcker shock did have an impact on OPEC, didn't it? We'd already said that. Uh, the Volcker shock and the swing producer action of the, of the Saudi Arabians definitely had its effect. So this graph indicates that how dramatically from the time of the um, actions that we described, we described a string of them, you know, the commodities futures, the Saudi Arabians, um, um, the Volcker shock and all the rest of that. Um, bringing down uh, the uh, OPEC export revenues, and they're dramat dramatically dropping. I mean, at the end of Reagan's administration, they're pretty much a shadow of their former self. Ronald Reagan's shadow <laughs> uh, could, could point to this again and say, this is a great achievement of mine, to be sure. Well, if it is a great achievement, uh, that's how it, we have to note how it was done. Um, and uh, it, as we are assigning the, I don't want to say credit and blame, but I want to say the causation, talking about the causation of it, it isn't just Reagan. Uh, it's, uh, it's these other, other questions. And you can't talk about Reagan, once again, without talking about the oil shock. Now, Reagan came to power in 1981. He won the election of 1980. Margaret Thatcher had been in power since 1979, so in a certain sense, she's always sort of a trailblazer uh, for Reagan. She had a low opinion of him. She had several meetings with him and came away from them saying that uh, the poor deer, as she put it once, <laughs> poor deer has nothing between the ears, uh, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> no, he was not a whiz uh, uh, talking about anything, really. Um, he's not the kind of person who's well prepared, doesn't read papers or any of that sort of thing. What I mean by, I don't mean newspapers, but, but you know, uh, policy paper, doesn't read that kind of stuff very well. Um, uh, he uh, could be known to perk up uh, when shown uh, visual uh, images, you know, mock-ups or pictures or something like that. He can learn from that. He could learn from that, people around him said. And also, um, he could learn to verbalize various problems in a very articulate way, as long as it was presented to him as a speech. Remember, he's an actor. That's his trade, um, his profession that he'd done for many, many, many years. 
actor and spokesman, you know, working from a script. Um, so uh, we can't say he's a ninny, although uh, during my generation, many of my uh, colleagues took the view that he was a ninny, uh, but not really. Uh, he's just not adept at the things that presidents were normally adept at uh, up to his time. You have to say something similar about Trump, but, but then you have to go beyond that and ask um, what were the other qualities and uh, etc. cetera. At any rate, uh, he and Thatcher, even though she didn't think much of him, um, uh, they breathed the same air and had no difficulty at all um, in developing this kind of spiritual kind of uh, affinity uh, one, one for another. Um, and they both acted against inflation and uh, described all of their deregulation moves, their deflation moves, um, described them uh, not in those terms, but in terms of uh, fighting against the inflation curse. It's perfectly true that under Jimmy Carter, we get this giant inflation. I remember this and experienced this with uh, great sadness, um, you know, going to the supermarket and find, finding these big jumps in prices every time you went. That's uh, everybody is affected by that. No president, no president can survive that uh, with his voters. <laughs> you know, no matter what Jimmy Carter achieved otherwise, uh, you can't, uh, you know, can't have an inflation that's in double digits during your administration and, and not get kicked out at when first chance the voters have to vote you out for any any alternative, anything they think would be better than that kind of thing. And um, Reagan was a great success at this. Well, 20% interest rates, they will bring prices down. This is not, not difficult to, uh, to interpret. And so here you see a graph for the inflation. You see what a great job he's done. So this section right here, this this is a great, uh, great achievement of Reagan's. And inflation gets down into its normal snake. It isn't bad. Uh, this, uh, you know, two to four percent inflation. That's fine. That's not you. Nobody's going to. Um, no, no politician is going to suffer or die from that. Um, it's when it starts getting up into the upper reaches. If it gets above five percent uh, already, that's a danger sign. And then ten percent. No, no. So uh, there were enormous, uh, enormous problems for the Carter administration that were solved. Therefore, for the Reagan administration, Reagan had no difficulty at all taking the credit for that. On the other hand, um, Reagan starts to take the view, and it's going to um, be even more pronounced with uh, his successors, uh, that um, this balance of payments thing can, can be let go. And we don't have to worry about that. And so under Reagan, we find that there's a massive dip in the U.S. balance of payments situation. So there we have uh, really the beginnings of the perspective that is sitting in, uh, setting in, uh, that says de deficits don't mean anything. Uh, this is meant for both deficits, for the deficit in international payments, for the balance of payments, that is to say, and for the budget uh, budget deficit. And uh, there's the problem with the budget deficit, uh, and uh, described in, a, in, in the language of the increase in the national debt. So if you have deficits, that increases the national debt. And um, Ronald Reagan uh, begins uh, this mood. Really, he's revolutionary in this way, uh, in that he doesn't seem to care in the slightest how big the national debt uh, gets. Now, the, the Republicans, since the Roosevelt administration have been calling for balanced budgets, have denounced the profligacy of the Roosevelt administration. Most of the arguments you hear against Keynesianism, uh, they argue against its uh, 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 presumed predilection for bu bu uh, uh, budget deficits, and there's all this kind of verbiage and, um, you know, essentially propaganda language that has been tossed uh, at the uh, Democrats by the Republicans for many, many years. It's quite traditional. Reagan breaks with all that. Um, and says it doesn't make a bit of difference. As you see nowadays, of course, it really doesn't make a bit of difference. Um, everybody is more or less attuned uh, to the idea that uh, we don't care how big the deficit gets. We can print the money. We just don't care. There's no consequence. There's no tomorrow. That has not been dif disproved uh, to this day. And uh, you can't say that it's just Republicans who think that way. Um, 
Democrats do too, but we do have an exception. Just um, we'll talk more about this when we get there, but look at this for um, the Democrats in the in the 1990s under Bill Clinton. They're the only people who paid off the national debt. <laughs> Imagine that. They raised taxes to pay off the national debt uh, during the 1990s as Democrats. Um, you know, they're faithful to the old time conservative um, religion, whether the Republicans have been long since become uh, strident atheists. <laughs> um, uh, but as soon as they're out of office, George W. Bush comes in and takes up where Reagan left off. Who cares how big uh, the national debt gets to be? Nowadays, it's here we're talking about the days when it was only in a few trillions, and now it's up to 30, 30 trillions. Uh, but finally, the Democrats have caught on too and said, yes, we, uh, we too don't care. Uh, the Biden administration uh, is now uh, providing for infrastructure um, uh, legislation that uh, really would increase the national debt uh, considerably, but uh, we don't care either. Um, and they keep raising the debt limit. There's a limit, you know, on the amount of the debt, but look how it's changed over the course of the Cold War, over the course of the last part of the 20th century. Uh, and look at, at how, how sensible it all seems, uh, this uh, national debt and the limit till about this point, it's about when we yield to Ronald Reagan. And uh, from this point on, the national debt starts its magnificent climb and it hasn't stopped, hasn't stopped yet. Um, and uh, I, I guess we have to say also that we haven't died from it. So those who like to scream about the national debt, some of the radio uh, radio personalities on the far right, people like Peter Schiff, I believe, people like that, from 30 trillion national debt. Oh, we can't have, look what we're handing on to our children, he, he will say. Um, uh, but uh, the people on the right, um, Reagan, um, George Bush, etc., right wing, Trump too, uh, they don't care about these things. It's not real. Um, and there's our magnificent national debt. And you see very clearly uh, that uh, it doesn't exactly take off during the Reagan period, uh, but it pretty much does. So the, the, the dramatic acceleration, dramatic acceleration um, right after the Reagan, right after the Reagan years. Um, and nowadays, of course, we take the view that uh, Dick Cheney espouses that uh, Reagan demonstrated uh, that deficits don't matter. There we are. Um, uh, some people call this modern mo monetary theory. There are various ways of, of, of describing it. Uh, but at any rate, um, certainly among the people on the right in the United States who are the apostles of property and of um, um, financial rectitude, and uh, all everything that goes with that, uh, it's for certain uh, that they're quite promiscuous when it comes to this. Um, all right, so during the Reagan period, it started to be argued by some of the uh, most clever people among the neoconservatives. And so Daniel Bell, a great sociologist, written all kinds of good stuff, um, and stuff that has educated me, and the, to which I owe a debt. He's a, He's a terrific writer and um, has a, a beautiful way of uh, making everything lucid and uh, clear. Um, uh, he wrote a book during this period called, uh, summing all of this stuff up and saying that we'd reached the point of a post-industrial society. So really all he's arguing in here is something we've been arguing all along, that there's such thing as a rentier society that starts to live by coupon clipping rather than actual manufacturing. Um, of a product and payment of wages, all the rest of that, start, you know, starts to act, no, it starts to act like a banker rather than like an, um, uh, an industrialist. Um, and we said this happened to the British at the end of the 19th century. And clearly it's happening uh, to the United States in spades at the point uh, that we are, we are discussing. And it becomes a whole theory of things um, that has to do with the um, change of the American position in the world division of labor, where the United States is no longer a manufacturing country and no longer a country that um, um, fills a role of a workshop 
one of the workshops of the world, um, but now is a country that provides mainly services and mainly financial services and uh, makes its money mainly by financial services. A picture of Dan Bell himself. Um, and uh, what this implies for the workers is uh, in a decreasing share, decreasing share of, uh, of their uh, national income of their countries. Um, though there is the graph that demonstrates the uh, ratio of, uh, of wages and salaries to uh, national income, and you can see it's decreasing through this whole period. Not dramatic decrease, pretty dramatic, but not wildly dramatic, not falling off a cliff, but falling um, through this whole period. It continues uh, to, our, to our day. So what does that mean exactly? I guess we have to say, frankly, it means the poor get less, that um, there's a conscious effort to destroy trade unions and uh, their share of uh, the, the workforce uh, that they have organized, uh, say the private workforce, goes from around a third uh, down to 10% or so. Uh, and that descent starts very dramatically with Reagan's actions against the air controllers. Um, and um, that attitude will uh, create greater, um, what's the word, um, uh, weaker unions, um, workers up against it. And, uh, and uh, in combination with the various other factors, uh, lowering of wages and uh, lowering of the standard of living. It's all frankly described by Paul Volcker uh, when he initiated his interest rate rises on coming to power, frankly, uh, um, frankly described as um, a lowering of the standard of living. Uh, and that's going to happen. Uh, how are they getting away with this politically? Why, why is the population put up with this? Um, lowering of the standard of living. I think it's because at the same time prices are being lowered. When there's a hyperinflation, you're hysterical. This wasn't hyperinflation, it was just inflation. Bad, but tremendous inflation. When you get up to double digits, that's tremendous. Um, uh, that they will put up with that. And, and they put up with, you know, put up with a lot. Uh, and then they get used to this sort of thing. And then we have writers, academics, ideologists who say, it's the most natural thing in the world. But the process we're describing is the process of a country becoming a rentier power. So where is this point when the United States now can be said to be a rentier power, uh, when the making of money in manufacturing starts to be eclipsed by the making of money in finance, finance, insurance, real estate, and related lines. That's during the Reagan administration. So, but you could see though that it isn't just a Reagan administration; it's a long-run trend. Uh, but it happens to be happens to reach its its crucial point, its nodal point, you could say, under the Reagan under the Reagan administration. Um, so, the liberation then of the speculator. They they are they can do anything they like, and. Um, this is in the Anglo-Saxon countries, in Britain and uh, the United States, mainly the United States. How about uh, the French? Now, the French are the ones who caused this revolt against uh, Bretton Woods back in the 60s. Are they going along with all of these changes? You can make the argument they're not. In fact, I would make this argument they're not. And they made the most bold attempt uh, while Reagan was in power um, to go in the opposite direction. Uh, in fact, to do away with capitalism. The phrase is taken directly uh, from the statements made by the French government uh, after 1981, when Francois Mitterrand, who you see here on the left, speaking with a rather quizzical uh, <laughs> um, um, Margaret Thatcher, who doesn't take him all, all that seriously, um, Mitterrand said he was a, a Abandoning capitalism, taking another course in capitalism. They nationalized a lot of big industrial groups, nationalized a lot of credit, a lot of the banks, um, brought in all sorts of new provisions for extending vacations, increasing wages, pensions, all the rest of that. It's a very dramatic uh, turn to the left 
uh, turned toward socialism, basically, uh, by the socialist socialist government. It might have done this ten years prior. They had a program commune with the um, communists back in 1978. They came very close to winning that election. They might have done that ten years prior. Um, but uh, this is when they did do it in 1981. And what did it produce? Something similar, I would suggest, to um, the big turn to the left that the French took um, when they were ahead of the gold block in 1936 um, uh, under the popular front of Leon Blum uh, when they signed the, um, the Matignon agreements and, uh, you know, for big wage increases and uh, all the rest of that, a big victory by the left. <coughs> uh, a string of nationalizations. Um, and uh, what happened was a huge capital flight. So bourgeoisie, the money, people with money, uh, big manufacturers um, fled in panic in 1936 and the French uh, went off gold, the gold block collapsed. Uh, we remember, we, you remember us talking about this in 1936. This has to be compared with uh, Mitran's uh, uh, experience. There's a huge capital flight that responds to his measures. Um, and uh, the French are now starting to worry about getting, uh, making devaluations to their currencies. I have to do this with uh, capital with capital flight. These devaluations, they're not good for the general currency setup, what you might call the snake, this idea that um, the European currencies, if they're going to play ball uh, together, and if eventually they're going to come together uh, an increasingly uh, integrated scheme, which they want, and, and they're going to end up with one currency shortly, um, have to stay within a snake. That's if they have to keep their policy, keep the values of their currencies roughly con consonant, you have to keep an idea of what the others are doing and don't let it get too far out of hand. Um, uh, devaluation is incompatible with the snake. The snake is necessary in order to keep uh, faith with the other European powers to maybe one day create a European monetary system. And that's what they have been um, prognosticating about for some time now, the idea of something to actually compete with the dollar is eventually going to be the euro um, by the 1990s, but not quite yet. Now it's only a European monetary system. They speculated that maybe the French want, would like to have it based on gold and others in Europe would like to have it based on gold. Um, so um, the um, uh, schemes then of Mitterrand, uh, they started to under, undergo a certain criticism. And so uh, this is somebody else in his government, Jacques Delors, he made the argument uh, that uh, we can't do this. Um, our European um, commitments are such that we can't have such a left-wing policy that creates such capital flight and devaluation and all the rest of that. Uh, cannot make these departures towards socialism. Although he himself was a socialist and uh, uh, since very sincere, made lots of arguments to that effect. The policy can't be done right now, he said to Mitterrand. We have to turn back. Um, for one thing, uh, we do not have the uh, uh, the approval of the Germans. So all of French independence depends on this idea that the Germans do not want to have their own independent foreign policy and, uh, are, and value Franco-German amity, friendship, value that. So the Germans, in the end, have a lot to say about this because the Germans are very pro-American, okay? And the Americans didn't like all this socialism, didn't like the Mitterrand policy anyhow. So between Jacques Delors and, and Cole, who you see here um, embracing Mitterrand, uh, Cole was a very big guy, um, uh, very large, large human. Um, and he's standing next to the rather ordinary sized uh, Mitterrand here. Uh, de, Gaulle would, de Gaulle wouldn't put up with it. And in the end, the French uh, could not lead the Germans to this extent. They could lead them in some ways. They could lead them when the Germans don't want to lead, and they don't usually. They want somebody else to do it. That's not going to last forever, by the way, but it still lasts. Even in our day, it lasts. Uh, nevertheless, the, um, the Germans 
couldn't tolerate a break like that. Put too much pressure on Mitran. Mitran started to see the cards on the table and uh, and decided to turn back uh, from his socialist ideas. And within a couple of years of having promulgated them, um, we find that Mitran is uh, is talking austerity, so. He's not going to revolt at all. And it has to do with this solidarity. We have to interpret the thing as historians. We have to interpret the thing in terms of the French desire, need uh, uh, to stay on good terms with the other Europeans, especially with the Germans. OK. Um, at the same time that all these things are going on, and Jacques Delors is emerging as the hero of the single European market, and eventually this is going to bear fruit when the Soviet Union collapses. Uh, not sure what would happen if that didn't happen, but it did. And uh, we'll have to note that they'll eventually they'll get the euro as a result of this. They'll have a completely independent currency for all of the um, uh, EC countries. And uh, it will be a, 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 a competitor with the dollar. Well, it's quite a thing. And that is what Delors essentially is promising to Mitterrand. You have to accept this defeat now. One day will, one day will emerge, and they're going to, they're going to emerge. Um, you could say uh, the fall of the Soviet Union is going to make Delors right, whereas he might have looked like he was wrong. Um, he's going to make, going to make him right. Well, at the same time, this is all going on. The, the Chinese have quietly adopted the same practices as the tiger economies in East Asia and have um, quietly become the most efficient tiger of them all. So these policies, which are to use state power um, um, in order to rearrange everything to make possible uh, an export economy and to export to the United States. So that starts with Japan, with the Dodge uh, uh, plan uh, at the end of the 40s, and it's more or less the Japanese line reinforced by the Korean War and all that. The Japanese will be selling their products in the United States and will be organizing their economy under pretty much a wartime scheme. We'll talk more about Richard Werner's ideas, his very, his very lucid ideas about this um, next time, or maybe the time after next, um, when we talk about the Plaza Accord. Uh, but the Japanese are the model, and then um, other um, um, Southeast Asian tigers, they follow Chinese, um, uh, follow them. And they interpret the attitudes of these tigers as something Chinese can take up. We've already talked about this. And then they uh, restored a degree of capitalism in the former treaty port um, coastal sections of China in 1978 under political circumstances that we, uh, we described then. And so they are marching along quietly now. They don't want to shake everybody up with a communist country becoming an economic giant. Um, and as a matter of fact, they take various measures to please the, the United States uh, that they are being transformed into a capitalist economy. And there are various ways they can do this. Uh, none of them, they keep telling their people uh, inside China, none of them are going to change socialism. Um, so if the imperialists are permitted to come to China and to use Chinese labor and all the rest of that, um, whenever they have some new technology, they have to share it with the Chinese. Uh, they have to train people essentially to replace them, um, if I can put it in that, in that way. Uh, train, train Chinese to replace them as they, as they profit from, uh, from developing China. Uh, so capitalism is developed there, developing there, and uh, it generally is regarded in a very, very rosy, friendly light on the part of the United States. And uh, look at its uh, tremendous achievements. Well, and practically no achievements up to this time. They're just getting started. By the time Reagan is out of office, they're just getting started uh, to grow. And this stuff will attract the attention of the Soviet Union. And we'll talk about um, on Dropov and the other Soviet leaders, eventually on Gorbachev, and how they regarded this uh, growth of the Chinese. You can see what, uh, what uh, heights it's going to reach, and it is still had not stopped, uh, this uh, very dramatic meteoric rise of, um, of um, Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese uh, production. Um, uh, so this is all beginning during this, uh, during this period, and uh, gathering some attention all over the world uh, 
uh, looked upon favorably by the United States and uh, the West generally and uh, enviously uh, by the by the Soviets. But the Soviets don't have to envy anybody uh, when it comes to economics. They're not in trouble economically. Uh, they may not be doing everything they can. Oh, and these uh, 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 dips in the oil price that I've been describing, they're, they're hurting them. They're making less money. But as we see today, you can put sanctions on them. You can do what you think is a, practically a straitjacket, and all they do is adjust to it, take autarkic measures for self-sufficiency, national self-sufficiency, and they survive it beautifully. So they have the biggest, big reserves now and don't have much debt. They're in way better uh, position economically, financially than almost anybody else. Um, these sanctions have not crippled them um, nowadays. The Russians I'm talking about, and, and during the period we're talking about uh, in the beginning of the 80s, um, yes, there was a dip in the oil price, but I mean, it's not, not the kind of thing that was going to destroy <laughs> the Soviet Union. Um, and moreover, politically, uh, the Soviet Union is marching from one great victory to another. Um, but you can say that uh, in Africa and in Asia, uh, the Soviet Union has emerged an enormously powerful force, revolutionary force, uh, you know, together with Fidel Castro. Not always approving of everything Fidel Castro does, uh, but uh, profiting from it as much as they can politically. When I say profit, I mean generally politically. So this is this odd kind of anomaly that we're contending with at the uh, end of our discussion of the Reagan years that the Soviets, even if they do have this or that economic question that they would like to tweak, fine tune, etc. I don't think you could say anything was causing them an economic crisis of any sort. You don't see them talking about crisis during this period. <clears throat> even if there are a few economic questions to be asked and maybe some policy changes in order to tweak the answers to those, um, politically they're running roughshod all over the globe. I mean, a colleague of mine at the time said, you know, they're, they're running the table in Africa. And they were doing brilliantly in Asia, too, and, they, and against the Chinese. Remember, they overthrew the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia um, with the South Vietnamese. And so everything looks very good for the, for the Soviet Union. You might even start to say that the Soviet Union seems to have won the Cold War somehow. All the measures that the United States are taking are responses to defeat in the Cold War. A whole string of these political de defeats, and then of course they got economic defeats, the French are against them, etc. The Soviets have the idea that maybe the United States is going out of business, and maybe as capitalists they're trying to get rich going out of business. Maybe we can somehow figure out a way to take advantage of that. That is not a response out of fear. That is a response out of maybe avarice, maybe arrogance. I want to start on that note next time in talking about the rise of Mikhail Gorbachev and the um, plans he had for reshaping everything. And I will be stressing that. They do not come out of fear or out of crisis. They come out of success and uh, confidence, not to say arrogance. So uh, that's something we can talk about next time.